The Editor's Preface to the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925, a forecast written in the year 1763. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925, a forecast written in the year 1763 by Samuel Madden. The Editor's Preface Of late years it has been common enough for authors to comment on the political and social tendencies of their own day by drawing fancy pictures of the state of the world many generations hence, when these tendencies have been worked out to their full development. From Lord Lytton's Coming Race, published in 1871, down to Mr. Bellamy's Looking Backward, and Mr. Wells's When the Sleeper Wakes, at least a dozen books have been written on these lines but till last year I was not aware how far back the catena of this prophetical literature could be followed. Working through the wrecks of an eighteenth-century library in the old-world town of Burford, I came upon the reign of George the Sixth, a little book of 192 pages, issued anonymously as long ago as 1763. As it deals with the years 1900 to 1925, there seems to be a special appropriateness in republishing it just as the period of which it treats is coming upon us. The reader will, I think, allow that the interest of its contents is sufficient to justify its reissue for his benefit. There is a good deal of amusement, as well of instruction, to be got from studying this forecast of the history of our own time, drawn four generations ago by an acute political thinker of the early years of George the Third. Like all books of its kind, the reign of George the Sixth has two sides. The author was not merely exercising the faculty of prophecy according to his lights, but was intending to influence the men of his own day by pointing out, in the actions of his puppets, George the Sixth, the Dukes of Bedford and Suffolk, and the rest, what ought to be done and what avoided in the year of grace 1763. In domestic politics he was a Tory. His nightmare was the perpetuation of that battle of the kites and crows, the objectless strife of the Whig factions, which had endured for the last two generations. His panacea was the more active interference of the king with his ministers, and the recent doings of George the Third had much encouraged him. Like the monarch whom he would fain advise, he must have been reading Bolingbroke's Patriot King, and dreaming of the realization of its ideals. Unfortunately the young sovereign from whom he hopes so much is not the farmer George of reality but a sort of more amiable Frederick the Great, a heaven-sent general who is also an enthusiastic patron of arts and letters. Did our author, we wonder, survive to learn the modesty of King George's military aspirations, or to hear of his interesting literary criticism as to Shakespeare's works being sad stuff, only one must not say so? In foreign affairs we find from the first page of the book to the last only two main ideas— Russia is the bugbear of the future. Unless her wings are clipped, she will dominate all northern and eastern Europe and become the bully of the world. We find that in 1900 she has not only devoured Poland and Finland and the Crimea and all her actual conquests, but has also annexed the two Scandinavian monarchies, a thing that appeared by no means impossible to an observer of 1763, when Gustavus III had not yet arisen to put an end to the internal factions of the larger northern realm. But if Russia is the great danger of the future to our author, France is the great danger of the present. She is unteachable and irreconcilable, and she must be smashed. There is no other way of dealing with her, and after two of her gratuitous attacks George the Sixth accomplishes, with what seems to us astounding ease, the complete conquest of the Bourbon realm. We leave France held down by English garrisons and governed by an Anglo-French regency, as she had been in the days of Henry V and his unfortunate son. Apparently our author finds finality in the carrying out of this rather drastic policy. He had so badly gauged French patriotic sentiment that he imagined that the nation could be bribed into acquiescence in foreign conquest by a liberal dose of trial by jury, habeas corpus, and the liberty of the press pages 102 to 105. The French seemed to enjoy these benefits with a particular exultation, as they came from the hand of their conqueror. Happy for France that it was conquered by such a patriot king. 
There is a strangely modern touch in the insistence of our author on the fact that England's greatest danger lies in the combination against her of Russia and France. It argues considerable penetration that he should have worked out for 1901 a crisis of this kind, a thing that is quite within the limits of the probable. In 1763 Russian politics were unscrupulous enough, but it was not very obvious that they would lead to the building up of the great empire which has since arisen. For when our author wrote, Catherine the Second had but just come to her ill-gotten throne, and had given no clear promise of her after-career while her predecessors since Peter the Great had been creatures of very common clay. Nevertheless, the future of Russia is accurately foreseen. Indeed, her coming greatness is even overstated, for in 1900 she is made the second, instead of the third, naval power in Europe, and her land dominions, as we have already remarked, are made to extend to the North Sea, instead of merely to the Gulf of Finland. Looking round the rest of Europe, we find in our prophecy much that has been fulfilled, as well as much that is hopelessly wrong. The Turk is still at Constantinople, though his northern borders have been clipped close by Russia. Page 28. The supremacy in Germany has passed from the Habsburgs to the House of Brandenburg, and Frederick the Ninth of Hohenzollern, a weak prince governed by his queen, holds the imperial title in 1900. A political prophet, fresh from witnessing the glories of Frederick the Great, might venture on such a forecast, but he is not happy in making it the result of a marriage, a thing most unlikely to occur between the heir of the Protestant Hohenzollerns and the heiress of the Catholic Habsburgs. No one could possibly have foreseen the actual details of the great change in Central Europe. The suppression in 1805 of the old Holy Roman Empire by Napoleon, born six years after our book was written, and the creation, sixty-five years later, of the new Deutsch Reich under William I of Prussia. The Germany of 1900, as our author sees it, is a perpetuation of the Elder Empire, not a newly formed state. Electors of Bavaria and Hanover, Dukes of Saxony and similar princes of the 18th century sort, are its chief moving powers. How, by the way, Hanover has got separated from England, and has an elector again while yet the male line of the gulf survives on this side of the channel, we are never told. Presumably it is a result of some of the unfortunate wars of George V, vaguely hinted at on page 3. Italian unity was another of the events of the future which our author foresaw. Nearly all the peninsula is under one king in 1900. Turin, Milan, Rome, and Naples all obey the same master. The patrimony of St. Peter had long been wrested from the church, and the temporal power of the popes is over. But two unfortunate forecasts are made in sketching the Italy of 1900. Its king is not a member of the House of Savoy, but a descendant of Charles of Naples, the bustling and well-served Don Carlos, whose successes our author must have had in his head when he conceived the idea, so grotesquely impossible to us, of a Sicilian Bourbon seated on the Roman throne. The other failure in his prophecy is the survival of a small Venetian state in northeastern Italy. A king of uncertain origin rules instead of a doge at Venice, and his existence has been prolonged by the aid of France, who has always found her account in intermeddling with the affairs of Italy. Page 11. The history of the Iberian Peninsula has not been so happily foreshadowed by our author as that of the Italian. It was permissible for a contemporary of our vigorous enemy Charles the Third, who did as much for Spain as he did for Naples, to believe that the realm of the younger Bourbon house had still some possibilities of revival in her. So the nineteenth-century history of Spain is no miserable story of Godoys and Esporteros, but fairly prosperous. Portugal is conquered and absorbed somewhere early in the century, and Sardinia has returned to the Spanish allegiance apparently when the rest of the dominions of the House of Savoy, in common with the other Italian states, were annexed by the victorious Bourbon king of the two Sicilies. It will strike the reader as strange to find that Spain has also contrived to recover Gibraltar, page 85, and apparently Menorca also, so that Great Britain has no foothold left in the Mediterranean. Moreover, the whole of Spain's American empire is intact. Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela are not the spawning ground of dictators and pronunciamentos, but peaceful and supine viceroyalties under the Bourbon crown. 
with little fighting power in them. Brazil, in consequence of the conquest of Portugal, has become a Spanish province, like the great lands to the west and south of it. It is hard for us, to whom the rebellion of the colonies is an only too well-known phenomenon, to conceive how unlikely it must have appeared to an observer of 1763, that the great possessions in the New World would ever develop a national spirit, and cut themselves adrift from their mother countries. Spain, it is to be noted, is not only still dominant in America, but has retained the Philippines, which formed the goal of an English invasion in 1920. Of the minor states of Europe as they stood in 1763, our author has allowed few to survive. He was a consistent believer in the idea that they were destined to be absorbed by their larger neighbors. The Swiss Confederation is still in existence, page 64, but no other third-rate power save the imaginary kingdom of Venice. Portugal has been devoured by Spain, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, no less than Poland, by Russia, while France, somewhere about 1850, has overrun and annexed the Austrian Netherlands and Holland. The Dutch, whose spirits were sunk in their slavery, had no inclination to assist their cruel masters, but they were kept too much in awe by the French garrisons in their several fortresses to listen to a deliverer. The minor Italian states save Venice have been incorporated long ere 1900 in the enlarged kingdom ruled by the Neapolitan Bourbons that the nineteenth century would see the creation of half a dozen new principalities in the Balkan peninsula our author did not dream. He makes the Sultan still master of all the lands as far as the Danube. We have left the description of France to the last, as it is the continental state on which most attention is bestowed. The French Revolution is an event of which our author has not the remotest foreboding. The France of 1900 is to him still the centralized, ill-governed despotism of his own day. The nobility were absolute lords on their own estates, but the slaves of their monarch, and the first to bear his fury, page 104. The Parlement had formerly raised commotions in this kingdom, by their obstinacy in refusing to register the royal edicts, but this appearance of liberty was now entirely at an end. Superstition and enthusiasm rule the lower classes, only tempered after 1920 by the great number of books that swarmed from the press which ridiculed and subverted the Roman Catholic religion. The towns had in many provinces fallen into decay. The state was half ruined, but a cunning and political prince, King Charles X, is still pursuing the aggressive policy of his ancestor Louis the Fourteenth, keeping Italy astir, preying on the ill-compacted German Empire, and oppressing millions of discontented Netherlanders. In alliance with his confederate, Tsar Peter the Fourth, he is able to dominate Europe, till engaging in an unprovoked war with England he loses both his life and his crown in 1919. Finally, national spirit is so dead, as we have already remarked, that at the end of the disastrous struggle with George the Sixth, the French monarchy is content to endure a permanent foreign garrison and to be governed by a foreign regency. Let us hope that our author was still a young man in 1763 and survived for a quarter of a century to witness the outburst of 1789 and the wars of 1792-97. to Turning from the continent to our own realm, we find much to astonish us in the England of 1900. The feature which will most amuse the reader is the state of our domestic politics. We are still in the midst of 18th century factions and parliamentary corruption. The fate of ministries depends on the intrigues of a nod of Whig dukes, each provided with his following in the lower house. The most objectionable and unpatriotic of them is the Duke of Bedford, a personage obviously modelled on that prince of jobbers, Thomas Hollis, Duke of Newcastle, whom a Tory writer of the early years of George the Third might well take as his bade noir. Like Newcastle in 1762, this nobleman sticks at the head of the treasury in a cabinet which is anxious to get rid of him, but has to endure him because of his prodigious parliamentary interest. He intrigues against his colleagues, sets his hirelings in the commons to vote against the ministry, and finally chooses the moment of an invasion of England to force the dismissal of his rivals on the king. Page 17. This is the precise line of conduct which Newcastle adopted in 1745-46, to when he bullied George the Second into getting rid of Carteret by resigning his office, just as the Jacobite rising was at its height, and the French were reported to be embarking at Dunkirk. 
It ultimately requires a sort of coup d'etat on the king's part to get rid of the baneful influence of this unpatriotic statesman. His Majesty descends on the Commons, much as Charles I attempted to do on January the 4th, 1642, and gives them a sound rating, accompanied by many vague threats. Thereupon the overawed assembly forget their terror of the Duke, and grant his irate master the subsidies that he demands. A beautiful sidelight on the possibilities of eighteenth-century politics is given by the fact that before declaring war on England, Tsar Peter the Fourth had conveyed immense sums into the kingdom, and had most politically distributed them to the most advantageous purposes. He had secured a large party, and this obstructed every measure proposed for coming to some speedy resolutions. Page 17. Reading this, we fancy that we are in the days of Charles the Second rather than those of George the Third. But evidently a hot partisan in 1763 might still believe that those who differed from him on external politics had been bought with foreign gold. French politicians of the more excitable sort are under the same impression today. Looking through the lists of the old cabinets of the 18th century, we are often surprised to note the enormous proportion of the ministers who sat in the upper house. But we are bound to say that our author overdoes the matter in absolutely reigning dukes upon us. In the first ministry of George the Sixth, 1900, the Duke of Bedford was continued as Lord High Treasurer. The Duke of Northumberland was removed from being President of the Council and succeeded by the Earl of Surrey, son of the Duke of Norfolk. The Duke of Marlborough was made Secretary of State for the Southern Department, and the Duke of Suffolk Lord Privy Seal in the room of the Duke of St. Albans, while the Duke of Grafton became First Lord of the Admiralty, a post just vacant by the death of the Duke of Atoll. Page 6. On a first reading of this book I had fancied that the Duke of Suffolk, the right-hand man of King George the Sixth, was a reflection of Lord Bute. But I fancy that this cannot be so. Our author, though a sincere Tory, is very bitter against Bute's Peace of Paris, concluded a few months before he wrote his pamphlet. Our late peace, he writes, was not altogether so advantageous as ministerial writers would have us think and our moderation was rather a little ill-timed. Preface, page 31. Nor was Bute either originally of a mean family, or one who had travelled through the principal courts of Europe and understood all their interests and connections with abundance of ease and perspicuity. Page 7. I conclude, then, that Suffolk represents the minister whom George the Third ought to have met, rather than the one who is actually in power when this book was written. It is very strange to find no trace of William Pitt in our author's prophecy, all the more so that his policy is entirely inspired by that of the great commoner. The entire beating down of France, the seizure of the Spanish possessions in the East and West Indies, the development of the American colonies, the perpetual increase of the fleet are all Pitt's ideas. Yet among the ministers of George the Sixth, there is certainly no one who in the least adumbrates the great statesman who had been thrust from power only a year before this book appeared. Was the author under the impression that George the Third disliked his mighty subject to such an extent that it would be useless to urge a reconciliation? Or was he content that Pitt's ideas should be carried out even if Pitt himself should not be entrusted with their realization? That the political England of 1900 is practically that of 1763 is most clearly visible in the budgets which the ministers of George the Sixth present to their parliaments. Our author has no conception of the enormous increase of national wealth which was to swell our revenue, within a century, to eight or ten times that of his own day. Or rather, he foresaw a large development both of trade and of manufactures, but forgot that such a movement would translate itself into figures. He is perpetually harping on the dangerous swelling of the national debt all through the nineteenth century, and more especially in the reign of George the Fourth. Page 3. But when we examine the enormous burden, which must very soon drive the nation to come to the sponge, we find that it amounted in 1900 to no more than 211 million pounds. In 1763 it was standing at about 140 million pounds, so that our author imagined that the addition of some 70 million pounds more would be a fair estimate for the next century. What would he have said if he had been informed that in January 1816 it would amount to over 900 million pounds, and that the mere interest on it in that year would be more than double his total estimate for the annual revenue of the United Kingdom? 
the very modest total to which the receipts of the exchequer were to amount in nineteen hundred is fourteen million pounds a sum that would have astonished all the world had we not been in possession of such a flourishing commerce as a matter of fact it seems probable that the real estimates for that year will amount to between eight and nine times our author's calculation looking into the details the army navy and civil service each cost in eighteen ninety nine just about eight times the sum indicated in the detailed budget set forth on page thirty three on the other hand the money required for the management of the national debt is less than six times the four million two hundred fifty thousand pounds which our author allows for it in nineteen hundred he had estimated that financial stress would have cut down the four per cents of his own day to two per cents by the time of george the sixth as a matter of fact we have come down to two and three quarters per cent but by the peaceful method of conversion and not by the violent shock of the repudiation of half the covenanted interest our author like most eighteenth-century writers was a great exponent of the all-importance of trade and colonization the financial salvation of great britain he tells us is bound up with the development of our north american colonies the immense region of country which the english there possess was what most extended and forwarded the british manufactures of australia and south africa there is naturally enough no mention in the book the first settlement in the former was a quarter of a century in the future seventeen eighty eight in the latter there was only an obscure dutch colony at the cape the east india company is still flourishing but the limits of its territories are nowhere stated we only know that in the reign of george the sixth they comprised not only indian possessions but batavia and the former dutch settlements in java the company is found in nineteen twenty aiding the king with a fleet as well as with a powerful land army page eighty six but north america was to be the great land of promise by the year nineteen twenty there were eleven million of souls in the british american dominions they were in possession of perhaps the finest country in the world and yet had never made the least attempt to shake off the authority of great britain page one hundred it is a minor point to note that the united states have now about seventy million inhabitants and the dominion of canada well over five million the really interesting fact in our author's picture is to see that he had just conceived of the possibility of a revolt of the united colonies and then rejected it george grenville's unhappy legislation was still in the future though quite close at hand it began indeed less than a twelvemonth after our pamphlet was printed other american grievances were already in existence but our author gives his reasons for thinking that they would never grow dangerous the constitutions of the several divisions of this vast monarchy were admirably designed to keep the whole in continual dependence on the mother country the multiplicity of governments which prevailed over the whole country rendered the execution of such a scheme combined rebellion absolutely impossible page one hundred alas for paper guarantees it was in all probability well within our author's lifetime that the spectacle of an intercolonial congress was to give his speculations the lie the chances are that he survived to hear of saratoga and yorktown and to see an envoy of the united states of north america walking in the streets of london he must have sighed to think of his own enthusiastic picture of ten british men-of-war on the stocks at once in boston harbor page sixty five and of the militia of New Orleans cooperating with our redcoats in the capture of the city of Mexico. Page 86. The great development of British commerce and manufactures which our author foresaw was to be accomplished, of course, without the aid of steam. Three deckers fight our naval battles. Huge East Indiamen bring us the wealth of Calcutta and Batavia. Internal communications are facilitated by splendidly kept high roads and numberless canals not by the locomotive or the steamer living in the heyday of canals the great bridgewater canal started work in seventeen sixty one our author looked on them as the great highways of the future rivers that formerly were almost useless were now navigated by large barges which increased the trade of innumerable towns and raised in many places new ones the canals which were cut joined rivers and formed a communication between every part of the kingdom villages grew into towns and towns became cities page ninety nine but the growth of great towns though it gratified the economical side of our author's mind did not please the artistic side 
Accordingly, we find that George the Sixth, like the Reverend Robert Spaulding, did not like London. Its prodigious size was its only boast. It contained few buildings that did honor to the nation. The meanness of His Majesty's palace disgusted him. In a word, he thought London a fine city calculated for trade, but not for the residence of the polite arts. Accordingly, he built a sort of Versailles in the Midlands, to which he removed the law courts, the Parliament, and all the public offices. Our author waxes enthusiastic over the beauties of the new city of Stanley, which was laid out by the royal architects on a regular and symmetrical plan. The façade of each street was carefully settled, and the erectors of houses were compelled to conform to the design. In 1763 we were in the full tide of classical architecture and Stanley must be conceived as filled entirely with domes and pediments and peristyles. Its cathedral far exceeded St. Peter's Rome. Its forty-three parish churches were no doubt in the style of St. George's Hanover Square, its colleges on the lines of Queen's College, Oxford, its enormous palace modeled on that of a German residence. We fear that to the real denizen of the year 1900 the city would be a nightmare, with its monotonous thoroughfares and its public buildings all in one single style. The description of the great gardens running down to the Welland and looking out on Rockingham Forest sounds more promising, though we cannot but smile when we read of the landscape in which the appearance of art was entirely banished, for our author's idea of nature unadorned included artificial mountains crowned with little temples and pinnacles, a prodigious quantity of masonry, and many cascades tumbling down artificial rocks till they lost themselves in meandering currents through the embrowning shades. Page 96. From the fact that the imaginary city of Stanley is reared in Rutland, not far from Uppingham, and close by the banks of the Welland, I conclude that our author must have been a native or at least a denizen of that part of the Midlands. This fact may be of assistance in the identification of his personality, which I have not been able to discover. Literary men interested in the county of Rutland can never have been very numerous. The reader will notice with interest on pages 37 and 94 the account of the creation and endowment by George the Sixth of royal academies not only of arts and architecture, but of literature. Our author has been good enough to give us a list of the original members of these institutions, which is not without interest. Oddly enough, his leading poet bears the name of Reynolds, which in 1763, one would have thought, must have been already associated with art rather than with literature. That great man united the elegance of Mason with the genius of Shakespeare. His colleague Pine, to the inventive imagination of Milton, added the correctness and harmony of Pope. Third among the writers was Young, whose comedies far exceeded those of the celebrated Simons. We should gladly have welcomed a few screeds and excerpts from the works of these masters of the pen, but our author does not indulge us with a single quotation. It is to be feared that, if he had done so, we should have found that they were written in the highest classical style of the eighteenth century. The romantic revival was still in the future when the reign of George the Sixth was written. The only authors who are quoted in the book are historians. Stevenson, who apparently wrote on continental politics, and is cited for the foreign relations of Switzerland, page 64, and Duchamp, a French writer who seems to have dealt with the military aspect of the great struggle of 1917 to 1920. It must suffice us to know, in a general way, that the Royal Academy of Polite Learning refined the English language and promoted literature in all its branches. The prize is given every year for the best tragedies, comedies, and essays, at the same time that they raised a spirit of emulation, were a means of enriching the votaries of genius. It remains to add a few words concerning the military operations which occupy so great a space in the reign of George the Sixth. The reader will find that they are entirely modeled on the tactics of Frederick the Great, which have evidently been most carefully studied. The usual advance in two lines of infantry with the cavalry massed on the wings, the use of the oblique order and the regular turning of one of the adversary's flanks are all copied from the great Hohenzollern. In his one disaster, his surprise by the French in front of Orléans in May 1919, George the Sixth does Frederick the honor of copying him even in defeat. For the battle seems modeled on that of Hawkirk. The marches of the English army are very carefully worked out and can be easily verified on the map. 
that to relieve Vienna in 1918 is a careful reproduction of Marlborough's march to Blenheim, which was the sole precedent that lay before our author for an operation extending over such a vast stretch of country. The movements about Lyon and Clermont, ending in the Battle of Espalion, pages 75 to 79, will all bear careful verification, both for the roads traversed and for the time taken. But there can be no doubt that in some of the campaigns the limit of days allowed for long and complicated operations is too small. George the Sixth contrives to move with a rapidity that would have astonished Napoleon himself. Having, for example, won the Battle of Espalion on June 23, 1920, it is quite impossible that he should have cleared the French out of Languedoc, Guienne, Gascony, Provence, and Dauphine, and occupied Paris by the 24th of July. Our author states that he met practically no opposition in subduing the southern provinces. But as we are told that the King of France was waiting before him with an unbeaten army of some 80,000 men during the latter part of these operations, it is certain that such incredible speed could not have been reached. Page 83. I regret that I have been able to make no plausible guess as to the identity of the author of this little book. It was printed for W. Nicol at the paper mill in St. Paul's Churchyard late in 1763. That it achieved some popularity in its day is shown by the fact that an enterprising German publisher thought it worth while to have the pamphlet translated and reprinted at Leipzig as De Regrung George de Sexton. I had hoped that the translator might have added a preface giving some information as to the author, but he has contented himself with making a very literal rendering of the English without adding a single note or remark of his own. If any reader can put me on the track of a literary man of strong imperialistic proclivities, who flourished in 1763, and had a connection with the county of Rutland, and more especially the town of Uppingham, I should be much obliged for the information. C. Oman, Oxford, June 20th, 1899. End of the Editor's Preface. Recording by Philip Gould. The Author's Preface to the Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925. A forecast written in the year 1763. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900 to 1925. A forecast written in the year 1763 by Samuel Madden. The Author's Preface. A preface, like a master of the ceremonies, introduces two strangers to an interview, and upon occasions of this nature the bookseller usually officiates as Sir Clement Cotterell to the reader. Footnote. Master of the ceremonies to George the Second and George the Third, from 1758 to 1774. End footnote. If we were to go on with our similes, we should compare an author to a convict at the place of execution. For let him have talked ever so much, he still has a last word to say to the public. With regard to the tendency of the following history, as it is taken up at a what's to come period and begun in an era that will not begin these hundred years, it may be necessary to say a few words, whether critical or explanatory, whimsical or elaborate, shall be entirely submitted to the determination of the reader. The Kingdom of Great Britain was divided into two powerful parties, as we are informed by our annals, when the great Dr. Swift took it into his head to write the history of Captain Lemuel Gulliver. The political tendency of that celebrated performance is too generally known to require any comment in this place. The dean, with the greatest concern, had long seen the distractions of the state, and knew that it would be utterly impossible in a direct chain of reasoning to combat with the force of popular opinion, or to contend with those obstinate prejudices which, in a course of ill-judged education, are too often and too fatally imbibed. Sensible of this ineffectuality, that great man set about an undertaking which would produce all the consequences he desired, without seeming to labor for any and fully expose the principles of faction without appearing the least solicitous to detect them at all. He wrote, he published, and succeeded, and the work is, at this day, one of the most masterly pieces of its kind in any language, and held in the highest estimation by the most sensible and judicious part of the kingdom. The modesty which is ever the companion of true merit would by no means admit your author to think of a parallel between this history and the travels of Captain Gulliver. Captain Gulliver 
even to say he does not is a sort of presumption as it is tacitly acknowledging the possibility of such a comparison but the very same modesty induces him to hope that in the course of the following sheets the reader will not sit down to an entertainment utterly contemptible for then it would be an unpardonable piece of ill-breeding to think of setting it before a guest the generality of modern writers have a mighty trick of saying to be sure they themselves are sensible the performance is trivial poor wants merit and all that but why if they are sensible their productions are so very despicable do they insolently think of offering them to the public why do they think of printing these very poor trivial and contemptible performances why why because because they neither think them poor trivial nor contemptible their very humility is nothing but an aggravation of their arrogance for the greatest vanity a man was ever guilty of was to say he had no vanity at all in the history of george the sixth we find few or none of those episodes or particular circumstances that might happen among the great men of his time the historian has confined himself to the actions of the prince alone and in the account of the exploits he little more than names any principal commander directing his whole attention to the conduct of the king he paints him resolute wise and magnanimous at home vigilant intrepid and fortunate abroad successful against domestic factions and victorious over foreign enemies a promoter of arts and sciences an encourager of religion and virtue and in short draws him a very great king and a truly good man we shall not offer so poor a compliment to the reader as to mention any personage of the present age of english growth who deserves the character given to the hero of the future but we shall very much pity his understanding if he meets with any difficulty in finding him out in the course of the following sheets the reader's own reflection must frequently assist him in the elucidation of particular circumstances for in performances of this nature it is totally impossible to be always as clear as a person could wish there are such things as an attorney and solicitor general a court of king's bench and pains and penalties it might be rather dangerous for the author to write with more perspicuity on some points but there is no law hitherto established against thinking so that while he is secure from the acquaintance of a messenger our author in any passage which may carry the appearance of obscure gives the reader leave to think just what he pleases of the relation the great contest that has long subsisted between two powerful factions affords the fairest opportunity for a satirical reader to exert himself and to lash any error that may be found in the principles of either even while he writes with a laudable view of reconciling both our historian in the gloomy portrait which he draws of the nation at the beginning of his work alludes very strongly to a late dangerous crisis when the kingdom was torn with party feuds and animosities and when some of the greatest people risked their own properties without any concern to enjoy the malevolent satisfaction of injuring other people the character of the future duke of bedford will easily lead us to think of a nobleman of the present times who is headed in opposition to the government of his king and the parliamentary proceedings in the reign of george the sixth may be considered as a well-turned compliment to the legislature of george the third in the perusal of the ensuing history the author has dealt with a particular satisfaction on the encouragement given to men of genius and the noble provisions which his hero allowed for cultivating the politer arts and sciences the academy which he established for that purpose endears the monarch imperceptibly to the reader of taste and was not injudiciously introduced to enhance the character of george and to inspire an emulation of the most generous kind in the bosom of his predecessors learning indeed notwithstanding the eulogium which has been paid to some great names has not found a sufficient encouragement hitherto in england and it is rather surprising that every nation in europe should have academies for promoting it but our own not to take up the reader's time however with reflections which in the perusal of the following sheets must naturally occur to himself it will be only necessary to observe further that the author by making his hero conquer all france and establishing him in the possession of that kingdom seems to hint that our late treaty of peace was not altogether so advantageous as ministerial writers would have us think it and that the moderation which we showed on that occasion was rather a little ill-timed upon the whole it is presumed that the history of george the sixth will merit the approbation of the candid and that the reader of sense will himself comment upon passages 
it would not be so safe for our author to explain, and make proper allowances from the nature of the subject, for any seeming heaviness of style which accidentally arises in the narrative. End of the author's preface. Recording by Philip Gould. Introduction to the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction containing a review of British history, A.D. sixteen sixty to nineteen hundred. Although the period in our history of which these sheets contain an account is one of the most singular and remarkable, and more detached from the general arrangement of our annals than perhaps any other reign, yet it is necessary to sketch the outlines of the preceding times, that the reader may comprehend the whole picture at once in his imagination, without the pain of continued recollection. The splendor of the English nation ought to take its date from the civil wars in the seventeenth century, which at the same time that they ruined individuals and threw the kingdom into a temporary state of confusion, laid the foundation for that immense fabric which has since been erected. It has been justly remarked that nations display their internal resources more, and produce great men more abundantly after a civil war than at any other period. The observation is drawn from history, and needs no philosophical inquiries to establish it. But most certainly the English nation made those prodigious acquisitions of trade within half a century after the death of Cromwell, that prepared the way for still greater increase. During the supine reigns of Charles the Second and James the Second, we were gaining on our neighbors. The revolution threw us into a new scene of action, and the wars we carried on, on the continent, at the same time that they secured the independency of Europe, opened new channels for our trade to flow in. But the most remarkable event of King William's reign was the beginning of a public debt, which has since been attended with such wonderful consequences. The reign of Queen Anne was a period in which the English arms made a respectable figure in Europe, during the continuance of the war, and her counsels like those of a succeeding reign a very pitiful one at the end. Footnote. An allusion, of course, to the great sacrifices made by Lord Bute at the Peace of Paris in February 1763, just before the publication of this pamphlet. End footnote. Our trade still increased, and with it our public debt. The greatest part of the reigns of the first two Georges contained little remarkable. In reading their histories we meet with none of those actions that raise and elevate the soul, and make us wonder at the power that executed them. The period of our history that is graced with the name of George the Third is more splendid. It forms a remarkable era in the annals of Europe, not from the number of great geniuses that adorned his court but from the multitude of virtues which constituted the character of the sovereign of a happy people. Yet even so great an assemblage of excellencies was not attended with a fortunate influence over the manners of his court. The great men of those days served but as a foil to set off the luster of royal virtues. Indeed, few endeavored to arrive at that summit of virtue which they considered impossible to attain, and therefore they prudently beheld the merit without any wish of imitation. In the reign of George the Fourth, eighteen ten to eighteen forty eight, were many remarkable events, but the most material occurrence which continued throughout that period was the amazing increase of the national debt. George the Fifth was a wise and virtuous prince, but the kingdom suffered from the want of capacity in his ministers, and felt a very severe shock in the conquest of Holland. Footnote by the French in or about eighteen fifty. End footnote. He came to the crown in one of the most critical moments that it is possible one prince can succeed another. His kingdom was in the greatest confusion occasioned by a long and unfortunate war with Russia. In vain had his predecessors endeavored at an immense expense to prevent the fatal aggrandizement of that empire. In vain had the parliament granted every necessary supply to prevent the northern kingdoms from being swallowed into one prodigious monarchy. Every effort which the Fifth Grand Alliance Europe had seen could make was ineffectual. Sweden and Denmark, notwithstanding their being so powerfully assisted, were unable to defend themselves. Everything submitted to the rapidity of Peter's arms and the first maritime power in the world, who had so long possessed the dominion of the sea, saw its fleets beaten and its coasts insulted. 
the ministry was unsettled and the violent agitation of the whole kingdom owing to the sad state of the public funds conspired to form one of those critical situations which require great judgment and abilities in the prince and a unanimous concurrence of his parliament to guide the helm with success the king in part effected it but during his long reign the nation was far from being in a flourishing situation and the dismal prospect of national bankruptcy which the most penetrating politicians clearly foresaw must soon come to pass cast a general damp on the spirits of the people in the end of the nineteenth century a certain languor in the administration foretold some terrible crisis was at hand in the midst of this general despondency the king died and was succeeded by george the sixth the history of whose reign is the subject of the following sheets a period the most remarkable and abounding in the most astonishing events that have ever been recorded in modern history. End of the introduction. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter One of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty-five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty-three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen forty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three by Samuel Madden. Chapter one, A. D. nineteen hundred. First acts of this prince's reign Ministerial changes, National debt, State of Europe. The very first acts of this prince's reign were such as caught the attention of all Europe. Footnote he ascended the throne the 16th of February, 1900, in footnote. They indicated not only a soaring genius, but a judgment far beyond his years. The nation had formed the most ardent hopes of their young sovereign. In his education and very youth he had given signs of what was one day to be expected of him, and all ranks of people turned their weary eyes on him as their pilot through that sea of troubles which it was too evident was rising to overwhelm them the king in all his actions showed himself worthy of their confidence his father's ministry was composed of a set of men who though they did not want abilities were not such as he chose to employ but his inclinations in this point could not be fully indulged from several circumstances the duke of bedford lord high treasurer had such prodigious interest in the parliament owing more to his immense riches than his personal merit that his removal would have been dangerous, so he continued him in his post till a more favourable opportunity should offer itself. The Duke of Northumberland was removed from being President of the Council, and was succeeded by the Earl of Surrey. The Duke of Marlborough was made Secretary of State for the Southern Department, and the Marquis of Kildare for the Northern, Lord Sands and Mr. Stevens retiring with pensions. Footnote in the eighteenth century the two secretaries of state bore these names and were supposed to divide the cognizance of foreign affairs between them the northern secretary in addition to superintending the affairs of northern europe was also supposed to keep an eye on ireland this clumsy arrangement was abolished in seventeen eighty two when home and foreign secretaries were created in footnote the duke of suffolk lord privy seal in the room of the duke of st albans and the Duke of Grafton, First Lord of the Admiralty, which then happened to be vacant by the death of the Duke of Atoll. These were the principal alterations which were made in the great offices of state. Footnote. These changes took place in February and the beginning of March, 1900. End footnote. But the above personages were not possessed of equal authority, or entrusted with the same confidence by the King. It was at first foreseen that the principal share of power would rest in the Duke of Suffolk, who possessed His Majesty's ear more than any of his other servants, and was designed to succeed the Duke of Bedford as soon as he could be removed with safety. This young nobleman was of a disposition congenial with his sovereigns. He had improved his mind by reading the most celebrated authors, and possessed that penetrating genius which easily comprehends and fully attains the objects of its study. He had travelled through the principal courts of Europe, and understood their different interests and connections, with abundance of ease and perspicuity. He possessed the confidence and friendship of the king who loved him, but his promotion gave offence to many. 
and caused great envy as he was originally of a mean family, and besides was sometimes apt to behave rather haughtily to his superiors. Footnote. This dukedom of Suffolk must therefore be supposed to be a new creation of the reign of George V, and not connected with the earldom of the same name held by the Howards in the eighteenth century. In writing of a Duke of Suffolk of mean family, our author may have been remembering Michael de la Pole. In footnote. The ceremony of the late king's burial was no sooner over, and the ministry settled for the present, than writs were issued for the meeting of a new parliament which assembled with the highest opinion of their new sovereign deeply impressed on their minds, and a unanimity of design to be expeditious in every public business that should come under their consideration. Footnote. 13th of April, 1900. End footnote. It would be tedious to the reader, and is below the dignity of history, to enter minutely into the debates of the two houses, and to describe the numberless little circumstances that attend the inferior motions of the legislature. These matters are proper for the annals of the times, but it is our business to exhibit only those outlines and stronger strokes of colouring that characterise the manners of the age, and give the boldest ideas of the history of the period. The first affair of consequence that came before them was the civil list. There was a debt contracted on it of above five hundred thousand pounds. This was paid off and with a liberality boundless, and perhaps in its consequences dangerous, they augmented that branch of the grants by half a million yearly, so that the civil list was now two millions a year. A prodigious sum increased by degrees for nearly four centuries. But what made this act of generosity imprudent to the highest degree was their settling it for life. It is true their opinion of their new sovereign was not groundless, but dangerous precedents ought never to be established. Nothing was of greater importance than their debates on the public debt. The amount of it was astonishing, although the fatal year 34, footnote, 1834, end footnote, had sponged 80 millions of it, it was now above 210 millions. The interest of this enormous sum alone amounted to 8,500,000 pounds and as the principal was every year increasing to pay off the interest, it was evident that it must very soon come to a sponge. Footnote. The actual amount of the national debt in 1899 is pounds, and the interest on it with the cost of management added is about £25,000,000. End footnote. To prevent the dreadful consequences such an event must be attended with, the Parliament laid a tax of 10% on stock for one year. But this was only a temporary expedient, and ruined numbers whose property in the public funds was fluctuating. They voted £500,000 to be expended in repairing the navy, and building new ships, a service most necessary and advantageous for the Russian fleet threatened that of Britain with utter destruction in case of a new war. This, it was feared, was not far off, for the truce which had been signed was almost expired, without having as yet produced its desired effect, a lasting peace. The grants on the whole amounted to fourteen millions. Footnote. The actual sum voted for 1899 is £112,900,000, just eight times the amount of our author's estimate. In footnote. A sum which would have astonished all the world had we not been in possession of such a flourishing commerce. But it was a time of peace, and had we been engaged in an expensive war we could have added very little to our income. But it will be necessary to present the reader with a view of the state of Europe at the time this monarch came to the crown. The nations that formed what we call the North, having been overturned by the immense power of the Russians, made one vast monarchy which comprehended Muscovy, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Lithuania, now called the Empire of Russia. Peter the Fourth was the monarch that swayed the imperial scepter, a prince whose martial feats were hardly ever exceeded, if we consider his barbarous courage and successful temerity. The acquisitions he had made were the effects of mere personal courage in himself, that excited an ardor in his troops, and not the consequence of policy or design. He was an indifferent statesman, 
and a savage man. No sooner were his own and his predecessors' arms successful in the attacks which they made on their neighbors, than he turned all his efforts on raising a maritime power superior to that of Britain. For above eleven years all the ports of the Baltic were filled with preparations, and in the year 1897 Peter saw himself in possession of a naval force of two hundred men of war of the line, besides an innumerable number of frigates and smaller vessels. The greater part of this prodigious fleet was manned. The amazing trade of his extensive dominions produced him seamen in abundance. In a word, he was superior to England by sea, and the British coasts were open to his invasions, when a truce was patched up between the two nations. The marriage which had transferred the dominions of the House of Austria to that of Prussia, and with them the imperial title, seemed to have extinguished that generous bravery and political reputation which the kings of Prussia had enjoyed for so many centuries. The Emperor Frederick the Ninth was in every respect a weak prince. He was governed by his queen, and she by the intriguing Count Buckberg, Prime Minister, a man of abilities, but who was suspected of holding a correspondence with his master's enemies. Footnote. Presumably a member of the princely house of Leap Buckberg, Leap Schomburg, still existing. In footnote. The last Prince of Baden had gained great reputation in the last war with France, and by his victories had enabled Frederick to conclude an advantageous peace with that kingdom. But being Buckberg's enemy had lately been disgraced and was entered into the English service, the late king receiving him with many marks of satisfaction. Charles X sat this time on the throne of France. He had the reputation of being a most cunning and politic prince, was brave, and had had some success at the head of his army against the imperialists. He had just entered into a close alliance with Russia. Had the phantom of a balance of power been the foible of these days, such an alliance would have alarmed all Europe. But it had no other effect than making the King of Britain very jealous of his neighbor. Spain was in profound peace, excepting a temporary disturbance which arose from a third rebellion of the Portuguese, but was quelled with very little trouble and the conquered nation saw not the least hopes of regaining their independence. Footnote. We are unfortunately not given any date for this conquest of Portugal by Spain, somewhere in the early nineteenth century. End footnote. The peace of Italy was almost at an end. The preparations that were making by the two kings of Venice and Sicily prognosticated the renewal of their quarrel. The patrimony of St. Peter, which had so long been wrested from the church, was again likely to be the scene of devastation. It was supposed that Venice would have the assistance of France, who has always found her account in intermeddling with the affairs of Italy. Footnote. The kingdom of Venice must have been very small compared with that of the two Sicilies, as we find on page 64 that Milan was in the hands of the latter. Presumably the kingdom of Venice only comprised the dominions of the old Venetian Republic. End footnote. Such was the situation of affairs in Europe at the time George the Sixth came to the crown. End of chapter one. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter two of the reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two. 1900-1901. to 1901. War with Russia. Naval defeat off the Dutch coast. Intrepidity of the King. Transactions in Parliament. Invasion. Battle of Weatherby. Naval engagement. As there were but a few months of the truce with Russia unexpired, the King hastened the preparations for war with redoubled vigor. He had many obstacles to overcome, but the greatest was the want of money. The national debt was a bottomless gulf that swallowed up everything. The navy was much behindhand in arrears, and many little mutinies had been raised by the sailors for the want of their pay. But at last, after a thousand difficulties, a formidable fleet was fitted out at the ports of Harwich, Hull, and Edinburgh. It consisted of fifty-five sail of the line and two and twenty frigates. The Russians were later in their preparations, so that when the truce was expired, which was the 8th of September, 
their fleet was not ready to sail. The command of the British squadron was given to the Duke of Grafton, the first Lord of the Admiralty. Admiral Phillips and Sir Charles Montague commanded the rear and van divisions under him. It is impossible to express the consternation of all ranks of people on the sailing of this fleet. The fate of the war depended not only on its success in the action, but on its being able to keep the enemy within the sound. Thirty thousand Russians were embarked on board their squadron, which consisted of seventy sail of the line, besides frigates and a large fleet of transports, as they designed to attempt an invasion. Their land forces were commanded by the Marshal Schmettau, and the fleet by the Prince of Philograph. Their superiority was formidable, not only in number of ships, but they were in general larger than the English, and their sailors had former successes imprinted on their minds. The Duke of Grafton, having collected the British squadron, set sail with a fair wind for the Baltic, but the third day he was blown by a storm on the coast of Holland. Unfortunately the enemy's fleet was out of the sound before the wind changed, and the same storm brought them in sight of the British fleet. It blew very hard when the engagement began, which was about four in the afternoon, with great fury. Footnote. November 3, 1900. End footnote. The Duke and the Prince both exerted themselves with great vigour and fought with the most heroic bravery. The Royal George of one hundred guns, the English Admiral's ship, was disabled by three Russian men of war, each of eighty guns. About six the Duke shifted his flag to the Blenheim, and in half an hour after the Royal George sunk. The Russian Admiral shifted his flag three times before the morning, for the battle lasted all night with the utmost fury. Sir Charles Montague was killed in the beginning of the engagement, and at last the Duke himself was wounded and carried under deck. Phillips continued the action with the greatest bravery and conduct, and had it pleased God that the wind had been less violent, he would in all probability have been the conqueror. But the storm increasing, the two fleets were obliged to separate. The Russians' loss was very considerable. Their vice-admiral was killed, they had three ships taken, one sunk and two blown up, with about seven thousand men killed and wounded. The loss of the English was much less in number, but they had several ships quite disabled. The day after this fatal engagement the British fleet kept in sight of the Russians, but without having it in their power to attack them. They were too much weakened by their loss, and the enemy making some motions which indicated a design to renew the engagement, Phillips thought it most for the king's service to retire into port and refit. The king was at council when the news of the action was brought him. He was undismayed and replied, The Lord's will be done. But it was a clap of thunder to every mortal besides. It was every moment expected that the Russian general would make a descent. The whole nation was in the utmost confusion. A sudden run upon the bank was near occasioning a stop and the stocks, which bore four per cent, fell down to thirty-five. In this critical moment all eyes were turned on the king, as the only pilot in so terrible a storm. It was impossible to be guided by a better, and had not Britain possessed a sovereign of such singular intrepidity and prudence, she would have seen her last days. His Majesty, when he found the turn affairs were likely to take, prudently ventured to send an order to the bank to stop payment till the kingdom was more secure, and, at the same time, issued out a proclamation assuring his subjects that this was but a temporary measure till the affairs of the nation would permit of more regularity. He immediately assembled the Parliament by proclamation and went himself to the Admiralty, where he sat three hours dictating orders. Dispatches were sent to every port in England to hasten the equipment of a new fleet. Troops were marching from all parts to the capital. In short, this young monarch was, at this critical moment, the very life and soul of the state. He managed everything himself, and almost without assistance, for his ministry and the council were so divided in their opinions and debates that he put very little faith in any of them. In the midst of this scene of confusion advice was brought that the Russians, to the amount of twenty-five thousand men, had landed on the coast of Durham and their fleet soon after disappeared, it was supposed, in order to convey a second embarkation. 
The affairs of Britain were now arrived at a most dangerous crisis, more terrible in appearance than any she had ever seen, and many circumstances combined to render her state really dreadful. The army was weak and ill-paid, the formidable naval power of the Russians having obliged the administration to turn all their efforts toward the fleet. The general despondence which prevailed throughout the nation upon account of the dead increased the shades of this sad picture. The riches of individuals were now found to be of but little avail to the good of the state, and while we enjoyed a more extensive trade than ever, the nation was upon the brink of ruin. The Russians threw all their force into their royal navy, so that our commerce had suffered very little from privateers. The Parliament being assembled in the greatest haste and confusion, the King went to the House, and in a sensible and nervous speech laid before them the dangerous situation of the nation and painted to them in the strongest colors the absolute necessity for vigorous measures to preserve them from their impending ruin. He informed them the enemy was landed, and on the march to York, that the only defense they had now to trust was to the army, which was itself weak and discontented for want of pay, that the late misfortune at sea must be speedily repaired. In short, that the urgency of the times required every moment to be made use of, he told them that money was wanted for a variety of uses, and that instantly, that the time was too short to raise it, and their credit too weak to borrow it. That as circumstances were thus situated, he saw no expedient but their enabling him to make use of the money in the hands of the bank trustees, which was designed for the immediate interest of the public debt for more public and immediate necessities. George made little doubt but that the Parliament would readily come into any measures at so critical a juncture for the good of their country. But in this he was fatally mistaken. Peter had conveyed immense sums into England, and had most politically distributed them to the most advantageous purposes. He had secured a large party, and this with the influence of the Duke of Bedford. For that nobleman was against the court in every debate, owing to his being debarred of that share of power usually given to a Lord High Treasurer, obstructed every measure proposed for coming to some speedy resolutions. At last, after the greatest heats and the warmest debates ever known, it was determined to reject the King's proposal, and address him to remove from his counsels and service the Duke of Suffolk, who they apprehended was the adviser of those measures. The king's indignation at receiving this address is not to be expressed. He had expected the most hearty concurrence in every national measure he could have proposed. But when he found out how much he was mistaken, he broke out into a violent exclamation against his enemies in the Parliament, and flew into a violent passion to the House. He turned the speaker out of the chair, and, seating himself in it, I flattered myself, said he, that a British Parliament would have acted on British principles. But, to your great dishonour, I find myself mistaken. A powerful enemy is landed and on the march. That time which you would waste in senseless disputes is too precious for me to follow so pernicious an example. I shall place myself at the head of my troops, and act for the honour and good of my country. But let those traitors that dare form machinations against the public peace dread the indignation of an injured and enraged sovereign. He had no sooner thundered out these words than he left the house with very visible marks of anger. As none knew the king's intentions, all were terrified. Those who had so violently opposed his former proposal, dreading his discovering their guilt, and were dismayed. They now offered to address his majesty to take the state under his protection. This resolution was quickly agreed to, but before it could be concluded, the house was alarmed with a violent mob who had broken into the antechambers, and threatened destruction to every man who should oppose the king's will. Terror now sat in every countenance. Nothing less than immediate ruin was the object of every one's fears. Without much altercation, however, they hastily drew up an act by which the king was enabled to apply all the money in the hands of the bank trustees to public service, in such manner as he thought most expedient. Footnote. First of December, 1900. In footnote. This was a dreadful stroke to the public credit. Stocks sunk almost to nothing, and the consequences were an immediate stop in the payment of the public interest. However, in violent disorders, violent remedies are necessary. 
The king no sooner possessed this money, which amounted to some millions, than he paid off all the arrears of the army, and gave orders for the same in the navy. Nothing could exceed the rapidity of his measures. His troops were rendezvoused at Buckingham, and in a few days he put himself at the head of them. The whole army, when collected, amounted to near thirty thousand men, five thousand of which were horse. In the meantime, the enemy under Count Schmittau had made little or no progress, considering the time they had been landed. Had they marched immediately for London the moment they were debarked, George would have had much less time to collect his forces. But Schmittau having taken Durham by storm, he most imprudently gave his troops three days to plunder. This conduct was madness itself. The Russians broke into all the houses and were guilty of every species of excess. Their cruelties were unheard of and unparalleled. The most tender age was no defense against these merciless monsters. Old men, women, and children were butchered in cold blood in the most shocking manner. It would make humanity recoil to relate their horrid barbarities. But their soldiers were soon intoxicated with liquor and cruelty, and all discipline and order were at an end. The king, being informed of the condition of the enemy, hastened his marches with all the expedition that was possible. He reached Lincoln in five days, and there understood that Schmittau, on the advance of his approach, had drawn out his men from Durham, though not without great difficulty, and was on the march to York. His majesty pushed on to meet him before he could reach that city, but as it was too strong to be taken by surprise, Schmittau encamped between York and Weatherby, Footnote, some eight miles due west of York, in footnote, and prepared to fight the king who was within five miles of him. There were several circumstances that induced George to determine on hazarding an action immediately. He expected soon to hear of another army of Russians landing, and he thought that avoiding a battle would damp the spirits of his soldiers. Add to this the barbarous ravages of the savage enemy called aloud on his humanity to put a stop to the miseries of his suffering subjects. He accordingly drew near to the enemy and reconnoitred their situation, and prepared to attack them the next day, the 23rd of December. Schmittau drew up his army on the side of a hill, with a rivulet in his front, a wood on each wing, and a village in his rear, which he had slightly fortified, and threw some battalions into the houses. All the king's motions seemed to indicate a design of attacking him in his front, and he had therefore raised several batteries that commanded the passage of the rivulet. His Majesty, however, finding that all the attention of the enemy was carried to their front, determined to make only a feint there, and attack them in their rear. Accordingly, about three o'clock in the morning, he gave General Summers the command of ten thousand men, with orders to remain in the field ready for action at a moment's warning, and as soon as he heard a signal they agreed on, to pass the rivulet and make an attack on the enemy's front, while the king himself would pass the river higher up, and fall on their rear. This scheme had all the success that could have been wished for. General Summers had no sooner made his attack than Schmittau gave in to the snare. He concluded immediately that the whole English army was at his front, and placing himself at the head of his first line, which included the choice of his army, he repulsed the English, but by the unparalleled bravery of the British troops was obliged to give way himself in his turn. Just at that critical moment the king made his attack on his rear with a fury that at once threw the Russians into confusion, and Schmittau, finding himself between two fires, would have made his retreat had it been in his power. He made every effort to recover his oversight, and thrice rallied and led his troops to the charge, but the unconquerable fury of the king's attacks overcame everything. Never man performed greater feats of personal valor. He had three horses killed under him, and as he was going to mount a fourth was near being shot by a Russian grenadier, but his carbine missing fire the king shot him dead. What concluded the day was Schmittau's being killed by a cannonball. His death dispirited his men, and they soon gave way. The situation of the ground would permit but a few to escape, and those in small bodies through the woods. About twelve o'clock the battle was over. Ten thousand Russians were killed and wounded, and seven thousand made prisoners. The loss of the English was not inconsiderable. It amounted to about three thousand killed and wounded. The Dukes of Rutland and Newcastle, the Earl of Winchelsea, and Generals Howard, Chales, Lord, and French were killed, 
besides which many officers of distinction were wounded. This victory raised the spirits of the people, and it was particularly pleasing to them as their young and next to adored monarch gained it. The shouts of the army were equal to the applauses of the people, and where a prince had given such uncommon instances of prudence as well as bravery, it was impossible but that he should be universally beloved. The king had discovered a disposition which no dangers could intimidate nor difficulties depress. He had no sooner fought the Russian army than he was informed a fresh fleet, more powerful than their former, was on the coast of Suffolk. This news, which cast a fresh alarm on the minds of the people, only quickened the rapidity of the king's motions. The English fleet was collected in the Thames and Medway, and by means of the greatest expedition was ready to sail, but waited for a fair wind. It consisted of sixty-four sail of the line and thirty-two frigates. George was no sooner informed of the enemy than he determined to command his fleet himself. He rode with all expedition to Chatham, and took the command from the Duke of Grafton, who was recovered of his late wounds, but his grace continued in the ship with his majesty to give him his advice. The Britannia on board of which was the king was without exception the finest ship in the world. She carried one hundred twenty brass guns, and in the opinion of the best judges, was so well built and manned that no single ship could live near her. Nothing could exceed the joy of the sailors at having their young victorious sovereign at their head. They expressed the greatest impatience to attack the enemy, and the wind, fortunately shifting, in two days gave them their desire. The Russian fleet consisted of eighty-nine sail of the line besides frigates and a fleet of transports which it was supposed might contain about ten thousand soldiers. About eight in the morning, footnote, January 10th, 1901, in footnote, the battle begun. The enemy's admiral, Steinhold, in a ship of eighty guns, and another of seventy bore down on the Britannia. The king met them and singly engaged them. At one broadside the Russian admiral was sunk to the bottom a dreadful stroke which threw their fleet into disorder. The other seventy-gun ship sheered off in a few minutes, and the Britannia was left without an enemy. The Marlborough was engaged with two Russian ships, who were too strong for her. But the king, pouring a broadside into one of them, immediately turned the superiority in favor of the Marlborough. By eleven o'clock the Russian fleet sheered off, and His Majesty chased. Nine of their line of battleships were taken, three sunk and two burnt. Forty transports were also taken and several sunk. Thus did this young and gallant monarch, with all the courage, conduct, and skill of an experienced admiral, defeat the enemy's fleet, which was so much superior to his own. This second victory raised the fame of the king to the highest pitch, changed the face of affairs, and spread a general joy through the breasts of all his subjects. End of chapter 2 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter Three of the Reign of George the Sixth, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty five, a forecast written in the year seventeen sixty three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, A.D. nineteen o one to nineteen o two. Military and naval preparations of the king, war with France, invasion of Flanders, battle of Winnex, rapid successes. The Russians defeated at sea. Peace of Beauvais. Two such glorious victories seated George with security on the throne, but his success did not occasion the least neglect in his military preparations. He was now superior to the enemy at sea, and was determined at all events to preserve his superiority. Ten sail were fitted out with all expedition at Milford Haven, and other squadrons were getting ready at Portsmouth, Plymouth, Chatham, Hall, and Lynn. The king had particular reasons for not suffering his preparations to relax. The king of France was at this time busy in fitting out a large fleet, and all the ports of that kingdom, from Amsterdam to Bayonne, resounded with naval armaments. George looked on them with a very jealous eye. The court of Versailles indeed gave out that they were intended against the emperor of Morocco, who had lately insulted a French ambassador but it was evident that preparations so very great indicated some further design in view. However, a trifling accident soon explained the views of the French king. An English privateer in the Channel having attacked another carrying Russian colors and disabled her, 
she hung out French colors. It seems a merchant at Rotterdam had fitted her out to cruise upon the English, and gave the captain orders if he met with an enemy too strong for him, to show French colors. This affair, in which the French were evidently aggressors, was made a pretense for a quarrel. The French ambassador at London demanded satisfaction for the damage done the French ship. The king returned a most spirited answer, and in short, after many memorials and replies, the king of France declared war against Great Britain, and was answered by his Britannic Majesty. Footnote. May 6th, 1901. End footnote. Charles, jealous of the British power, had entered into an offensive and defensive treaty with Peter, and had agreed to receive the Russian ships into the ports of France, and by combining their respective fleets to overpower the naval force of George at once. Fortunately for the king, Peter was dilatory in his preparations. The British fleet, to the amount of ninety sail of the line, was ready for action, and saw no enemy that could look it in the face. But the king was determined to lose no time. Collecting a large fleet of transports, he embarked twenty thousand men on board them, and resolved to form an invasion of France. He gave out that he designed to attack Brest, and to deceive the enemy the better, sent vessels to sound the depth of water on several parts of the coasts of Brittany. The enemy marched down troops from all parts of France to defend themselves where they thought the descent was intended. But the king's plan was well laid and unsuspected by the court of Versailles. Instead of steering to the coast of Brittany, he directed his course to that of Flanders, and without the least opposition landed his whole army on the beach of Blankenburg. He immediately published and dispersed a memorial to the Dutch, exhorting them to take this favorable opportunity of regaining their liberty, promising to do everything for them that could be in any way conducive to so salutary an end. But their spirits were too much depressed, and they were kept too much in awe by the garrisons that were in their several fortresses, to listen to a deliverer. George marched towards Bruges, which capitulated without the firing of a gun. Ostend, Ypres, and Newport cost him some days, but his progress was so rapid before the French had an army to oppose him, that his difficulty in these conquests was not very great. The Marshal Duke de Vivion at last appeared near Dunkirk after a forced march at the head of forty thousand men. The king was no sooner informed of his approach than he determined to fight him directly. Delays to him were dangerous, whereas the enemy would every day increase in strength. Vivion was encamped at Winnox, and entrenching himself waited for reinforcements. But George, having sent spies to reconnoitre his situation, found that his piquets were placed in a very negligent manner, and that it would be no difficult circumstance to surprise him in the night. In pursuance of this opinion, about one in the morning of the 10th of September, at the head of ten regiments forming the first line of his army, he attacked the enemy's entrenchments. The onset was no sooner made than they were forced. The French soldiers ran naked to their arms. Several of their generals did all in their power to rally them, but in vain. The Duc de Vivion had his head shot off by a cannon-ball in the beginning of the attack, and before daylight their army was defeated and totally dispersed. The enemy being pursued in great numbers made prisoners, the king presented himself before Dunkirk, and the cowardly governor gave up the town to his astonishment without attempting anything for its defence. Calais opened its gates to the conqueror, and St. Omer surrendered after a week's siege. These rapid successes terrified the court of Charles. They were surprised at the boldness of George's attempt to make a regular attack on so powerful a monarchy as that of France with such a handful of men. But it was a maxim with the king to despise numerous armies. Forty thousand men, he often said under a good general, were a match for any number and with some favourable circumstances even twenty-five or thirty thousand. Charles, to stop the progress of his Britannic Majesty, placed the Duke of Ventadour at the head of a prodigious army collected from all parts of France of near one hundred thousand men, a force if well managed being divided into two or three armies, strong enough to overwhelm George at once. But numerous as this body of troops were, they came only to be spectators of the success of the King of England. Without a single blow his majesty made himself master of Boulogne, and slipping by the French army in the night surprised Montreuil. The road to Paris was now open to him. The royal family retired from Versailles. 
Charles would have tried the fortune of the war himself, but a violent fit of the gout confined him to his palace. The Duke de Ventadour, by his injudicious motions, was incapable of stopping the King's progress. He laid siege to Amiens, and it surrendered before the Duke could arrive to protect it. Neufchatel had the same fate, and the King, astonished at his own success, had thoughts of making a flying march to Paris. The French army formed such an unwieldy body that it was forever exposed to the sudden attacks of the English. Ventador was but an indifferent general, and had to oppose a young monarch whose late actions rendered him the most celebrated commander in Europe. In the meantime the attention of Peter was called off in a great measure from the English war by a new enemy that had made a formidable attack upon his dominions. Bajazet, Emperor of the Turks, an old enemy of the Tsars, thought this a fair opportunity to recover Krim Tartary, which the Russian monarch had conquered from him in the last war. Footnote. This is not a very happy forecast. The Crimea was conquered by Russia as early as 1783, instead of in the end of the 19th century. In footnote. In this situation he listened with pleasure to the remonstrances of the English ambassador, who left no stone unturned that could engage the emperor in the war. Bajazet thought the moment so fair when Peter was engaged in a most expensive war with Great Britain, that the Grand Vizier, Selim, at the head of two hundred thousand men, marched into Russia. The Tsar collected his forces to oppose this inundation of Turks and just as the two armies were beginning the war, the Russian fleet of near one hundred sail of the line appeared in the channel. The British fleet under the Duke of Grafton, who, though he had sometimes met with ill success, was one of the greatest admirals Britain had ever produced, was about equal in force to that of the Russians. It was not long before the two admirals found an opportunity to engage. It would be tedious to give the particulars of this furious battle. It lasted a whole day without being decisive. The Russians lost five ships of the line and the English four. If anything, the advantage was for the latter. But before morning the two fleets parted, and, the wind blowing a violent storm for the two next days, nineteen Russian men-of-war were driven ashore on the coast of Norfolk, and were there burnt. The English lost only two, but had several dismasted. This stroke secured to George his superiority at sea. This navy was so powerful that the French fleets were blocked up in their ports and were not strong enough to look the English in the face, so that Charles now saw all his hopes blasted, and the King of England at the head of a victorious army ready to march to Paris itself. In this critical situation he determined to sue for peace. George, whose conduct was guided by justice, not by inordinate ambition, readily listened to the proposal. He appointed ambassadors to meet those of France at Beauvais, where a peace was soon agreed to. The Tsar sent an ambassador on his part, so it became general between the three nations. The principal article was that Charles should cause to be paid to the King of Great Britain two millions of pounds sterling for the expenses of the war, at three equal payments, six months between each. The treaty being signed by the two monarchs and the Russian ambassador, footnote, 11th January, 1902, in footnote, George withdrew his forces out of France and evacuated all his conquests. End of chapter 3. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 4 of The Reign of George the Sixth, 1900-1925. to 1925. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. 1902 to 1916. Interest of the national debt reduced. The building of the palace and city of Stanley. The Royal Academies. George the Sixth encourages the arts, sciences, and literature. Never was any quarrel concluded more gloriously. George now found himself at peace with all the world. He had been victorious against the most potent monarchy on earth and another formidable kingdom. These successes secured him abroad, but at home all was confusion. The stopping payment of the interest of the public debt had thrown innumerable families into extreme indigence, yet the measure was absolutely necessary, and the very existence of the nation had been preserved by it. But as the war was now at an end, the Parliament took under their consideration the state of the national debt, 
and after a multitude of proposals, calculations, and debates, they agreed by a small majority that the interest at the rate it then stood was a burden too great for the nation to bear, and appointed a committee to draw up a bill for reducing it. The preamble to this bill set forth the sad internal state of the nation, painted in the strongest colors, the impossibility of paying the interest on the national funds, showed that an attempt to go on in doing it must end in a total bankruptcy and the utter ruin of all concerned, that under these circumstances half the present interest would be of more real value than the whole, in the dangerous situation they were now in, and the bill accordingly enacted that the interest on every fund of which the national fund was composed should be reduced by one half. Footnote. That is, from four to two per cent. That the former rate prevailed in 1900 is shown by the figures on page 8, giving £8,500,000 as the interest on £211,000,000 or thereabouts. As the interest for 1903 was, after the change, just £4,250,000, we must conclude that the King had somehow contrived to fight through the war of 1900 to 1902 without any further borrowing. End footnote. History cannot produce an instance of such an event as this being effected with so little disturbance. All ranks of people seemed content with their half. They had lately seen the extreme danger to which the nation was reduced for want of money, and they cheerfully considered that, if they lost half of their income, it was to preserve their lives, their liberties, and the remainder of their fortunes. This great event would not have been brought about with so much ease and expedition, but the path was sketched out by the bill which was drawn up for the same, but which miscarried in the reign of George the Fourth. But it no sooner passed into a law now than its good consequences were immediately felt by the nation in general. Such an enormous encumbrance was no sooner removed than George found his kingdom vigorous and more formidable than ever. It may not be unentertaining to the reader here to lay before him the particulars of the grants of the year 1903 after the peace had taken place. Fifty thousand seamen, including marines and ordnance for sea service, two million nine hundred thousand pounds. Forty-five thousand men, land forces in colonies in Great Britain, etc., and ordnance for ditto, two million two hundred fifty thousand pounds. Greenwich Hospital, thirty-five thousand pounds. Milford Hospital, forty thousand pounds. Building, rebuilding, and repairing His Majesty's ships, six hundred thousand pounds to the nine foundling hospitals, ninety thousand pounds, adding new fortifications to Batavia, etc., one hundred thousand pounds, to His Majesty for fortifying other places in the East Indies, fifty thousand pounds, deepening and enlarging the harbour of Hull and docks, two hundred thousand pounds, civil list, two million pounds, total, eight million two hundred thirty-five thousand pounds, Interest of the national debt, four million two hundred fifty thousand pounds. Total, twelve million four hundred eighty five thousand pounds. Footnote. Putting the actual estimates for eighteen ninety eight to eighteen ninety nine beside these figures, we find them eight times as great. An army of two hundred fifty thousand regulars, excluding India, militia, and volunteers, costs us twenty million pounds. A navy of 93,000 men requires 25 million pounds. The civil service estimates to run about 22 million pounds. End footnote. A young monarch of his active spirit was not likely to waste the time which peace left on his hands in idle dissipation. He understood many arts perfectly and was tolerably well acquainted with most. His favorite, the Duke of Suffolk, was also a lover of literature and spent a great part of his time in the conversation of men of letters. The arts and sciences at this period in England wanted nothing but encouragement to raise them to a very splendid height, and to make the age of George the Sixth rival any of those remote ones that are so celebrated in history. It is both entertaining and curious to reflect on their state during this reign, and compare it with the present. Those great men whose names alone would have immortalized the age of George the Sixth are now gone, and have left none to succeed them. Indeed, they still live in their admirable works, 
but have left few successors to their genius and abilities. But to leave this digression, let us take a view of the arts in the period of which we are speaking. George had a natural taste for them, and what was of equal consequence to their success was rich, liberal, and magnificent. Hitherto his time had been engrossed by more weighty concerns, but now that peace left him the master of his time, he displayed a taste and genius in more arts than that of war. London, though the wonder of the world, never pleased the king. Its prodigious size was its only boast. It contained few buildings that did honor to the nation. In a word, it was a city finely calculated for trade, but not for the residence of the polite arts. The meanness of His Majesty's palace disgusted him. He had a taste for architecture, and determined to exert it in raising an edifice that should at once do honor to his kingdom and add splendor to his court. In Rutlandshire, near Uppingham, was a small hunting-box of the late king, which George admired, not for the building, but for its beautiful situation. In his hours of rural amusement the king formed the design of raising a palace. Few parts of his dominions could afford a more desirable spot for such a purpose. The old seat stood on an elevated situation, which commanded an extensive prospect over the adjacent country. It was almost surrounded with extensive woods, which having been artfully planted added the greatest beauty to the prospect without intercepting the view. On one side there was an easy descent of about three miles which led into an extensive plain through which a river took its meandering course. Many villages seemed to rise here and there from out the woods which gave a great variety to the scene, and the fertile plain was one continued prospect of villages, groves, meadows, and rivulets, and all was in the neighborhood of a noble and capacious forest. Footnote. There is no place of the name of Stanley near Eppingham. The situation described is that of Stoke Dry or Glaston. The river is the Welland, and the distant forest that of Rockingham. In footnote. This charming situation must have struck any person of less taste than the king. He was charmed with it at the first sight, and soon after thought of building a palace on so advantageous a situation. The famous Gilbert, whose name is immortalized by so many works of genius, was at that time architect to the king. He drew the plans of several palaces, out of which his majesty chose one, and immediately set him about the work. Many difficulties were to be overcome before even the first stone could be laid. The fabric was to be built with Portland stone, which could not be brought to the spot without an infinite expense over land. To remedy this inconvenience, the Parliament passed an act to make the river well and navigable to the very plain, at the bottom of the hill on which the intended palace was to be raised. The same session also granted His Majesty a million sterling towards the expense of building this magnificent pile. The King spared no cost to render this edifice the most magnificent and superb palace in the universe. Gilbert had an unlimited power granted him to follow his genius in every particular without the least restraint. Fleets of ships were continually passing from Portland to Hull and Lynn with cargoes of stone, which were conveyed in barges to the place where the palace was to be built. Ten sail were sent to the different ports of Italy to load the finest marbles. In short, nothing was spared to make this palace the wonder of the world, but the erection of it was only a part of the king's design. Footnote. It was founded in 1907. In footnote. In the plain above described, His Majesty formed the scheme of raising a city, but was staggered at the thoughts of the expense. However, more the architect hinted to him that if His Majesty was to raise a few public edifices, and remove some of the courts from London thither, they would alone occasion numbers to build near their residence, that His Majesty's fixing his own residence there would also occasion a vast increase of building. The King was pleased with the thought and determined to execute it. The great Gilbert grew the ground plot of that part which now reaches from St. Mary's Church quite to Great Hollis Street in Scotland Square. St. Stephen's was his work, too, and is a beautiful monument of his taste and genius. That church and the Academy for Architecture, footnote, both erected in 1909, in footnote, were the two first public buildings that were raised. Moore was the artist who erected the latter, but this deserves a more particular mention. 
Architecture was one of the king's favorite studies, but its being an art was recommendation enough for that great monarch to encourage it. The plan on which this academy was formed was finally imagined to secure a perpetual protection. It consisted of a president with a salary of two thousand pounds a year. Gilbert was the first. Six, senior, footnote. The first instituted were Comans, Holt, Moore, Brown, Salviola, the Spaniard, and Stevens. End footnote. And twelve, junior, footnote. James, Philipson, Pedreo, an Italian, Rickson, Manley, Hare, Thompson, Johnson, Wheel, Place, Richards, and Stevenson, end footnote. Professors had the former five, and the latter three hundred pounds a year each. What a noble institution was this, worthy the monarch who formed the outline and the minister that finished the design, footnote, the Duke of Suffolk, end footnote. George had the satisfaction of seeing Stanley increased beyond what his most ardent wishes could have desired. Most of the nobility and many of the rich commoners, in imitation of their sovereign, erected magnificent palaces. It grew the fashion among the higher order of his subjects to erect houses at Stanley. The Dukes of Suffolk, Buckingham, Richmond, Kent, and Bridgewater, the Earls of Surrey, Winchelsea, Middleton, and Berry, and Mr. Molesworth particularly distinguished themselves by the splendor of their palaces amongst many others. But what gave a prodigious increase to this noble city was the erection of the Senate House. That noble building which is now the admiration of all Europe was the masterpiece of the celebrated Moor. The front is certainly one of the finest pieces of architecture in the world. It was finished in 1913. The same year the Parliament assembled in it, and here I cannot help quoting a passage in their address, as the praise it contains was perfectly merited by this great monarch. Assembled in this edifice, which is one of the many works of your majesty's magnificence and princely encouragement of the arts and sciences, we cannot omit congratulating your majesty on the completion of so noble a monument of your grandeur in the nation's glory. And we return your majesty our most dutiful acknowledgments for so splendid a mark of your esteem for your parliament which led you to erect so magnificent a senate-house out of your private revenue. We join the rest of your majesty's subjects in expressing our admiration for your royal and princely virtues. Your noble encouragement of the arts and sciences added a fresh luster to the title of hero, which your majesty's great actions had before most justly conferred. This session voted the king a million sterling for the senate-house, and granted five hundred thousand pounds a year till his majesty's building should be finished. Nothing could exceed the magnificence of Gilbert's plan for this glorious city. The houses were all built to form one general front on each side of every street. Nothing was used but Portland stone. The streets were broad, well paved, and the buildings not too high. Many noble squares were marked out and some finished. The theatre was the work of His Majesty himself, who drew the plan, and showing it to Gilbert, that great man told the king it had not a single fault but this compliment had not sincerity enough in it. It certainly contains some blemishes, but it is undoubtedly a work of genius. The three centuries before His Majesty's reign did not produce so fine a building. Its simplicity and grandeur are admirable. The Academy of Painting was another institution which would have rendered the memory of any monarch dear to the arts and sciences. It was reserved for the age of George the Sixth to be graced with a list of great artists in this country, whose works should render their own names as well as his immortal. From the foundation of the English monarchy to the age of George, Britain had never seen a painter that could rank with the first class of foreign artists. Footnote. This is rather hard on Reynolds and Gainsborough, both well-known men by 1763. In footnote. But though this great king could not create, Yet he drew by his encouragements and rewards artists from their retirements and set them to work. No genius ever met with even a rebuke from George. Merit was sure to be rewarded. The excellence in any art the certain road to fortune. Gilbert was the architect of the building, and its grandeur is well known. The president of this academy had a salary of two thousand pounds a year, ten seats each five hundred, and forty young artists were maintained and had apartments allotted them with pensions of one hundred pounds a year each. Nothing was ever better planned to promote the progress of this delightful art. 
and its success in England under this reign was accordingly prodigious. Nicholson, an English artist, and one whose name will forever stand foremost in the list of painters, was president of the academy. Besides this appointment he was loaded with riches and created a baronet. The Battle of the Angels in the saloon of the palace which this great man painted is second to no picture in the world. Tompkins, Veer, and Norton were all English artists, and not inferior to the celebrated Italians of the age of Leo X. The first was equal to Correggio himself, and the last exceeded Domenicino and Guido. Who does not glow with ardor at the remembrance of the works of these divine masters? Who does not regret their loss? They are gone, and have left but few behind them that can pretend to any degree of competition. The other artists that had seats in the academy are well known. Simpson painted the Jupiter Olympius in the saloon of Apollo, a picture which would alone have immortalized him. The most splendid court in Europe was sure to be attended with a multitude of foreign artists. Spinoza, Martelliat, and Carviante were received in the most distinguished manner by the king, and had each pensions of five hundred pounds granted them, besides being liberally paid for their works. Never was any art so much obliged to a sovereign as that of painting to George the Sixth. The palace itself, which has for so many years been the delight and wonder of Britain, was finished in 1915, eight years after its foundation. Never was any building raised so expeditiously. It was indeed astonishing, but the king, sparing no expense, Gilbert finished this superb edifice in so short a time, by means of the infinite number of hands he kept constantly employed on it. It would be endless to describe this amazing pile of building, and it has already been done in all the languages of Europe. The famous Escorial of Philip the Second of Spain, and Versailles of Louis the Fourteenth of France, of both which we read such pompous accounts, were infinitely exceeded by Stanley. The shell of the building alone cost the king above eight millions sterling. The adorning and furnishing it was the work of above fifty years, and the expense infinite. The ceilings and apartments were painted by Nicholson, Tompkins, Veer, Norton, and many other celebrated artists. The king had no sooner begun to build than he sent connoisseurs through all Europe to collect paintings, statues, rarities, books, and manuscripts, and in these commissions he spared no expense. He even dispatched ambassadors to Constantinople and throughout all Asia to make collections. And always choosing the properest men for executing his commands, he succeeded better than any monarch that ever attempted to tread in his footsteps. The palace of Stanley thus became the repository of all the curiosities which the world afforded. No wonder his palace became so celebrated and drew such numbers of foreigners into England, when the collection of pictures and statues it contained were almost equal in value and number of capital pieces to what remained throughout all Europe, and his library contained above thirteen hundred thousand valuable books and manuscripts. This glorious building was not only the residence of royalty, but might properly be called the Temple of the Muses. In his hours of relaxation from business the king here conversed with Reynolds, that great genius, who united the elegance of Mason and the genius of Shakespeare, with Young, whose comedies far exceeded those of the celebrated Simons, with Pine, who to the inventive imagination of Milton added the correctness and harmony of Pope. What a memorable epoch was it in history when a George the Sixth conversed with three great poets in a palace built by Gilbert and painted by Nicholson. But an event happened that for a while turned off the attention of the king from these sublime employments. End of chapter 4 Recording by Philip Gould.